Okay, turn to page 82. Let's stand together. It's between the first and the last. be seated. Even though this world is full of darkness, oh, you light the way.
When I'm at my weakest, Lord, you give me strength. Even though this world is full of darkness, still you light the way. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate that song reminding me of one of my ministry life verses, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly will I therefore rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's been a great evening. Let's pray together as we uh, prep for looking into the Word of God again tonight. God, we love uh, lifting our voices to you. We worship you in your greatness, and yet in the same breath we are recognizing with great humility and great gratitude that you are constantly stooping way, way down to minister to us and to meet our every need. And uh, we love... Uh, the privilege of being able to lift our hearts to you, Lord, at any time. And we love the power of prayer, as your people have even testified of again tonight. And we love the way in which uh, prayer plays such a significant role in really everything we do, both for you and with you, Lord, including and especially the study of your word. We are, I think, constantly recognizing the all-important ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. We refer to him in a lot of different ways, including the great illuminator. And uh, we often use, in our vernacular, the language that uh, the Holy Spirit of God turns the light on for us, and for that we're glad. And then to think that after he does that, that he really positions himself to help us to employ uh, the truth into our lives. And that, in turn, becomes a part of our prayer as well. So thank you for the blessed evening, and thank you for the opportunity we have, aided by the Spirit of God, again tonight to look into the Word of God. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Our, our study in Second Thessalonians continues. We have come to a very significant section in chapter 1. Uh, verses 5 through 12, I will give you a second to get there, and then we will go ahead and read this section. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, we'll read through uh, verse 12, the end of the chapter. So here we go. This is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which also you suffer seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the church in Thessalonica, as you know well now, was being heavily persecuted for her allegiance to Christ and her devotion to the word of God. Paul in this section is seeking to comfort the church in her persecution. I, I, I love our testimonies. I love even our prayer times. Um, and, and I listen and, and, and engage and part of the reason why I do is because I just know that uh, the Holy Spirit of God is doing what he always does, and that is orchestrating everything together. So in my mind, I put two things together. I put um, Brother Dan Miller's testimony together with Brother Andrew Heading's prayer just before, um, uh, just before they took the offering and said, Oh God, uh, first with these men and now... Uh, now with our study, we are, be we are being reminded of this very basic fundamental reality, and that is we are here. We, we are in. I, I was reflecting on Christ's uh, great high priestly prayers in John 17, as you know, and you recall these words. Christ said, in regard to you all, he said, I, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil and, and from John 17 comes that familiar phraseology, right? We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And I'm amazed, you, you know, I've been hearing that, um, that statement since a young person. And the reason why I continue to hear it and the reason why we continue to share it with each other is because it holds such, such biblical weight. It really does capture a lot. And boy, someone could hand that phrase to you and you could speak for days at all of the uh, of all of the spiritual implications of that that we're in the world and and yet we are not of it i love i, I love the prepositions you know that i love and i'm encouraging one of you to write a book and i i, I have some good ideas for you because i i don't know that anybody now you know the books i come up with i know no one's going to buy but still it's exciting I don't know that anybody has said, boy, you, you, you better pause that to prepositions. Someone better preach and teach on in and out and above and below and beside and with. You see, all these, you could take every preposition and you could make a chapter from, boy, somebody ought to write a book. God, somebody ought to write a book in regard to this. And here's Paul. He's seeking the comfort the Christians in Thessalonica in their persecution. God invariably takes us out, right? But there's a little bit different message in regard to that. But what, what does God have anything to say with? Does God have anything to say to His people when they are in? And of course, God has a lot to say because we are in. And so Paul is seeking to comfort the Thessalonians in their persecution. I, that, that is so significant. In verse 5 in particular, so full, we've, we, we've already um, spent a couple of sessions hovering over verse 5, and we actually use it tonight as a jumping off point. And I will give you uh, the premise of God's message to us tonight, um, and we will be pursuing this not only tonight, but in the, the weeks ahead, the Lord willing. I, I, I can state it broadly to you, first of all, and, and then a little bit more narrowly. And, and the premise is this, everything that God does is right. I know you know that, but sometimes we just need to rehearse it, right? Sometimes we just need to hear it again. Everything that God does is right. Everything that God does is righteous. This is an amazing reality. 
And the point tonight, and this is where we stayed a little bit more narrowly, including his judgments. Every judgment that unfolds at the hands of God is right. It's amazing. God, I'm speaking broadly again, God is never wrong. It's one of the reasons why, wow, you know, when we wake up in the morning, we ought to be very much interested in spending time with the one who is never wrong. Because it seems like we almost always are. Mrs. Ann would be able to testify to you, and, and I probably should state it a little bit more accurately than this. I'm softening the thing, but I'm often saying, oh, man, Ann, and of course I ultimately talk to God about it, but I say, man, did I mismanage that thing? Sometimes I say, and fortunately Mrs. Ann keeps me encouraged, but sometimes I say, man, I'm, I am turning into a mismanager. We, we just get so many things wrong. It's kind of like, boy, if you can rub shoulders with someone who is right, and especially someone who is always right, then, wow, you would think you'd want to be rubbing shoulders with him all the time. And, and of course, that, that's the way it is with our great God and our Savior. And, of course, we get to walk with him. Everything that God does is righteous, including his judgments. We will before too long. I, I love our studies. I've often reveled in this with you. I, I love our various services. That's why I, with passion, come. You, you think I come only because you pay me, and I realize that uh, if uh, I, I didn't come uh, to our services, that I, you, you know, wouldn't have a position for very long. I fully understand that, but you, you need to know that I'm not coming because you pay me. I'm coming with passion, and I have often reflected, and I've heard you reflect on it too, and I appreciate that. I love it, especially our core people. I love I love the distinction between our services. I really do. And so I'm here with passion. You know, certainly on Sunday morning, and that's our largest group, but boy, I'm here with passion on Sunday night, and I'm here with passion on Wednesday night as well, and, and just about anything else that you all would come up with as, as well, we'd, we'd be here with passion. I love I, lo I love our um, ser services. We are on Sunday morning before too long because i got to say that with qualification because of the way you guys are with your study. You sometimes don't get very far, but I, we, we will before too long in our study in Genesis be engaging the narrative in regard to God's judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. You guys know enough about that to know of the harshness of, of, the, um, of the judgment. But it's in that narrative regarding divine judgment that we, we get the familiar rhetorical question, shall not the judge of the earth do right? Answer, yes. Every time. God does everything right, including his judgments. It doesn't matter when we're talking about divine judgment. It doesn't matter what the judgment is. It doesn't matter who it involves. It doesn't matter when it occurs. You can be assured of this. It is right. We'll be belaboring this a little bit, and I have divine warrant for that. We'll be belaboring just this just a little bit, and, and for many reasons, including the fact that, folks, God is going to continue to strengthen our apologetic, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. I wanted to engage you, God's people, with this a little bit more, too. If you look at the term judgment broad enough, then you realize that it incorporates the idea of chastisement. Chastisement, from a biblical standpoint, uh, pertains to the saint, those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. We, we know that judgment in regard to condemnation is no more for God's people, and all of God's people said to that. R Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to them who are, do you remember the preposition? In Christ. And we're so very thankful for that. But God spanks us. And the reason why he does is because he loves us. Yeah, we have two classic texts dealing with chastisement, Proverbs chapter 3, oh, I think verses 11 and 12, and then 
uh, he, Hebrews um, chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. And in both of those texts, it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So this is family stuff. It's not a view to any kind of condemnation, but it is a view to his loving us and spanking us in order to correct us. And I, I bring that up to, your ten, to you tonight j just to recognize with you that God is always right in the realm of chastisement as well. And you and I have talked about that before. We've been prompted to talk about it because of some of these classic texts. And one of the things that we've said together, our resolve before God with a view to the truth of God's word is that, that God is never excessive. His, his chastisement for God's people is always spot on. It's always exactly what it needs to be. We, we've heard some powerful testimonies of some hard chastisements. And yet as we've listened to the testimony, we've gleaned from that that even the one testifying is relating to us that it was exactly what God needed to do. And fortunately for us, you, you know, uh, fortunately for us, because you have a desire to walk with God and because basically that's characteristic of your life, God's chastisements generally are, are, are small. I remind you, and you know this is my favorite thing about chastisement, that if you engage the word of God, one, one of the ministries of the word of God, let's see, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Part of that multifold work and ministry of the word of God in your life is chastisement. In other words, I wake up in the morning and I read the word of God and I'm not only prompted to rejoice, but also the truth at when, when needed, actually the biblical truth chastises me. It just sets the record straight. It puts me on the right course so that God doesn't have to spank me. Isn't that exciting? It's yet another reason why I, with passion, am spending quality time with God in the, in the morning. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we do that, why I do that. And one of them is that I don't want to be spanked. And the word of God, in, in, in small measure, does that, and it paves the way for us to not um, have to worry about um, strong and heavy uh, chastisement. But our chastisement is always, always right and God sometimes and this too is the reason why we brought up chastisement sometimes God uses here's the connection to persecution because that's the theme here in second Thessalonians again the church is being persecuted the connection between chastisement and persecution is God sometimes uses persecution to chastise us but not all the time, and so we're back to our four C's. I wouldn't expect you to remember this, but sometimes, uh, sometimes we're persecuted because God uses that persecution to spank us, to chastise us. But other times we're being persecuted, and these are our four C's, our former four C's. Sometimes we're being persecuted just with a view to our connection to Christ. Sometimes we're being persecuted just so that we'd be brought more into conformity with Christ. Sometimes we're being persecuted just so that we can have intimate communion with Christ. Sometimes we're being persecuted so that the day comes when we can be coronated by Christ. If you take those four C words, I can tell you're very excited about this. If you take these four C words and add the fifth chastisement, I think you've covered all of the bases which is kind of neat. I, I have a by the way for you, and I gotta be careful here as we, um, as we funnel our thinking. <laughs> God, with, God with all of this is fitting us for the kingdom. I, I wanted to note this with you. That's what Paul means when he says in verse 5, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom. That's one of those phrases where you could read that, pluck it out of context, and you'd say, boy, I, I, I don't get that. Um, that seems to fly in the face of the fact that we certainly don't want what we deserve from God. It seems to fly in the face of grace, but... 
but in, in, but in actuality and contextually it does not. We, we know that all, everything is of grace. We know that we don't deserve any good thing. We, we understand that. It's a foundational truth for God's people. But what Paul is saying here, and it probably deserves its own message, is that God uses all of these things in our lives, these five C's, um, pers- and then the P word, persecution. He, he uses all of those things in our lives to fit us for the kingdom. Not that we ever become deserving of the kingdom, but rather where we become fitted for it. I, I like the word outfitted, where God is actually outfitting us for what is coming. And, and that's Paul's message here. But what is true of the judgment of the saint in the form of chastisement? What is true of the judgment of the saint in the form of chastisement that it's right is also true of the divine judgment of the sinner in the form of condemnation. And this is what Paul goes on to speak of in verses 6 through 9. Let's read the verses. We'll come back next week, the Lord willing to discourse them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I know why you're interested in this, and I know why you will be back next week, again, the Lord willing, with passion. God is going to be strengthening our apologetic and, and let me tell you why that's so crucial. We have got to have an answer for the oft-posed question, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? Paul is about to answer that for us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. You have impressed primarily one thing upon our hearts and minds, and it's valuable. Broadly, you always do the good and right thing. You always are right. And narrowly, with a view to your judgment, it's always spot on. And this is going to be the foundation to our having a good apologetic so that we have an answer to everyone who asks us of the reason of the hope that is in us. So God, please continue to strengthen our apologetic and make us an effectual witness for the as we live in this world, but are not of it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, let's turn to number 223. Number 223, I stand amazed. When you find it, let's stand together. Sing the first verse, 223.